Hello, and welcome to part six of some critical but not prominent shipbuilding trends of the 1880s to 1950s. And now we are into World War I. We really are. Hello. So, World War I. What have I picked as the ships to illustrate World War I? Express Renown, Courageous, Glorious, Furious. All of those vessels. The Tagatoffs. No. Some of you who watched a video recently about armoured carriers will recognise armoured cruisers. Sorry. Will recognise the name of one of these ships. The Dupe de Long. Now, of course, when it was built as an armoured cruiser, it was the centrepiece of their part two of the Junico strategy. First part, destroy enemy battle fleet on a sea of flotillas of torpedo boats and submarines. Second part, armoured cruisers go forth and destroy trade. We won't get into the flaws in that plan today. The next one, the next one was laid down in 1913 and this time... She was a submarine. She's Lebo of her class, in fact. The, the Dupe de Lone class are a pretty cool little class. A range of 2,350 nautical miles at 10 knots on the surface, or 120 nautical miles at 5 knots submerged. That's not that bad for 1913-14. She has two triple expansion steam engines. You starting to see why I'm talking about her? Yep. Ah, steam engines on a submarine. She was 853 tons on the surface. 1,291 tons submerged. So that's 438 tons tons she needs to go down below the water. It's not unusual, but that's still quite a lot. Which is, I suppose it's better to have positive buoyancy than negative buoyancy if you're a submarine, naturally. Her top speed was 18 knots on the surface, which frankly is down to the steam engines. 10.9 knots submerged, which is very, very good. 41 crew. Two external bow 17.7-inch, uh, that's 450-millimeter torpedo tubes. Two external stern 450-millimeter torpedo tubes. And four single... 450mm rotating torpedo launchers. One 75mm gun and uh, one 47mm. That's one 3 inch and one 1.9 inch. Uh, the 1.9 inch is a Hotchkiss deck gun, so it's probably of the pistol revolver type. The two vessels built were Dupi de Long and Sen. Both were stricken in 1935 to so survive World War I in French hands. And just so you know, Dupi de Long is back. As of 2006, the name is back in service. And that is the French intelligence ship. Yes. Um, it was designed and built in the Netherlands. And then it was taken to Fales, France, where Fales Naval France added in the electromagnetic intelligence part of the vessel and provides a 350-day operational availability a year, of which 240 can be spent at sea. You know, electronic warfare matters. 
So perhaps that tell you know, I'm not saying this is any clue to French naval capabilities, but um, the armor cruiser was the cornerstone, the revolutionary cornerstone of the Junicol. The submarine was the next generation of that. And really, the submarine is critical to French battle plans in World War I. Now, we have an electromagnetic research, aka an intelligent ship. With that name. I'm not saying it is now the cornerstone of French naval for, of firepower and forces, but if I were, I don't know, Russia, etc., when that thing enters the Black Sea, I would be being very reticent about operating anything within long range distance of it. You know, come on, the French have a habit here of a very critical, very well built, certainly useful asset. Barring the armor cruiser, which was just terrible. And the steam powered submarine. Okay, maybe the Russians don't need to be so worried. We'll leave that to one side. Now, steam submarines. Submarines to keep up with fleet. They are definitely a trend which you start to see around World War I, mainly because it's working out how to use submarines. Theoretically, they're this wonderful ambush predator. But pre-nuclear power, they can't really get anywhere. Or rather, anywhere they can get, they're not getting there exactly that quickly. And most of it's on the surface. And yes, people are going to come back and go, Ah, but the snorkel was developed. But and the submarines are getting out into the Atlantic Ocean. That's wonderful. And yes, there are some exp uh, very expensive, very special submarines which go a lot further. But those aren't the rule. Those are known about and studied and, and really stick out because they're the exceptions. And in World War One, it was all sp uh, it was all supposed to spin on the actions of the battle fleet. That big battle. What Jutland was supposed to be before Jutland actually happened, and people realized, hang on, things might not be like this. In which case, having submarines that could keep up with the fleet and then plop away underwater, unseen, of hopefully the enemy, pass underneath them and fire torpedoes from the other side, that's really quite attractive. Only one problem with that. On the surface, they can do 18 knots. The battle line can do 21. Battle cruisers can do 28. Dang, blasted. And underwater, they're doing 10 knots. Battle line's still doing 21. So, what you really need to do is, instead of keeping up with a fleet, you need to manage to get to the area of engagement first, sink down, take your position, and wait for the enemy fleet to pass over you, and hope you're in the right place. Okay, so what you need is really the third dupe of loam, because you need the intelligence, because that's the only way you're standing a chance of getting that submarine in the position first. Maybe try and shower on something. Next thing. Now, this is an Anchusa. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Class Corvette. They are also known as the Cabbage or Herbaceous Borders group, and they are the final part of the Flower Class run of Corvettes, which are built under the Emergency War Program. You see, one of the interesting things is that in World War II, the Royal Navy gets accused of building a cra of, of forgetting about submarine warfare and crash building escorts, which they don't actually. They, as I've said before in many others, 
they are starting the construction sign of Ungvund well before World War II begins. Well into the 1930s, arguably the late 1920s. Where that narrative is true, though, is the First World War. Where they see submarine warfare coming, but they think of it as a fleet-on-fleet -fleet action. Because the rules of warfare mean that you shouldn't do the ungentlemanly acts which the Germans end up doing. And then you need to convoy them. And, well, there's no, if there's no reason to convoy ships, you don't need to convoy escorts. So you don't have convoy escorts. It's only later when Jellico, thanks to a paper written by Henderson, is able to bash a lot of politicians and, this is the thing, it's often got this as politicians as much as the admirals on the head and go, we need to do this, that they start convoying. Then you need convoy escorts. Voila! Occasionally used as queue ships because they looked like Merchant vessels. In fact, Briony is kind of special. She is used to escort vessels, well, from about 1917 onwards. And theoretically is designed as a merchant, is disguised as a merchant ship. Although some convoys she did as a merchant as a queue ship some convoys she escorted openly now the reason i picked her out is because at one point she is commanded by a gentleman called bernard armitage warburton lee who, of course, in World War II, commanded the H-Class Flotilla during the first British battle in Narbeck, the second actual battle in Narbeck, in 1940. And that's where, of course, he's 44 years old and he wins a VC. So think about that. In 1940, he's in command of an H-Class destroyer flotilla. And he is... 44 years old. In 1917, he's 21 years old. He would actually command Briony between 1933 and 1934. He served on her earlier than that, but yeah. She is one of his first commands. And the fact is, she is still around in the Royal Navy into the 1930s. So this is another reason why the Royal Navy isn't building a mass, doing a mass build escort building program in the 1920s and the early 1930s, because they still have a large number of these escorts sitting around. And people are going to sit there and go, but how useful were these escorts? Well, 12, nearly 1,300 tons, top speed of 16 knots, a uh, single screw, four cylinder triple expansion engine, supplying by two power boilers and deploying two and a half thousand horsepower. Could carry, well, normally, a couple of um, quick firing four inch guns, a couple of 12 pounders, and some depth charge throwers. This ship, built under a crash program in World War I, was only sold and broken up in 1938. She was still useful all the way through that period. The Royal Navy kept a fairly large number of them around through that period. Replacing them, that's complicated. Getting the budget to replace them. They should have been replaced. They should have been... The, you could build sloops. The British should have been able to build sloops. Uh, the British were allowed to build sloops. Everyone was allowed to build sloops as many as they wanted. You could. Have, the British should have been building sloops. 
But this class, for two reasons, are uh, part of the case against them building slopes. One, they had them in service. And two, we built those so quickly in the middle of the last war. Of course we can do it again. Of course. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Do you not doubt the ingenuity and capability of the British to build uh, the ships? Don't you? You can hear the arguments going on in those, in those rooms. You can hear the discussions in those drawing rooms and parlours of people debating what to build, what to spend money on in Parliament and all these discussions going on. The real reason is people don't want to spend money. They want the money to be spent on their own pet projects. So they're going to keep up with reasons for not spending the money on this one. Which just tells us, the more the world changes, the more it stays the same, and that we should always get worried, very, very worried, when our political leaders start referring to the ingenuity and greatness of the people. Insert nation name before people. Because usually that means they either don't have an idea themselves of how they're going to deal with it, or they think they can get away with not dealing with it on their turn in charge, so it'll be someone else's problem later on. And choose a class sloop to be alone. Examples of trying to make an idea fit an existing concept in order to understand it, and examples of a great idea which unfortunately was used as a bookend when it should have been used as a platform. Um, oh, almost forgot. Where's my hat? So, this one. Some of you might know from watching these videos, some of you won't, that my aunt and my aunt has sent me a bet, a family bragging rights bet. So the most important bet you can possibly imagine. And it is this. If I double get my subscribers from where they are when I'm recording this to roughly 13,000 by December the 31st, she'll be pictured wearing Blackburn Blackman face mask, her and my poor uncle. So... Starters. If you're interested in any of these designs and more are coming, um, please look at the spreadsheet link down below. But also, please, if you like, like, if you really like, please share, subscribe, share it everywhere you can because it's family bragging rights. It matters. There are many things in life which I cannot control and I cannot work out. Winning the national lottery, I can't do that. Stopping my dog trying to emotionally blackmail me for biscuits. I cannot do that. He's going to sound like he's in distress until he gets all the bickies he wants. But with your help, there is one thing I can accomplish. I can win the family bragging rights bet. So please, please help. What else we got come up? We have Chiefs of Staff of the Axis Navy. There's one coming up in front of it uh, uh, immediately after this. And um, yeah, you should enjoy that. I hope you will. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of interesting stuff which doesn't get discussed. And when I say it doesn't get discussed, I mean in English language. It doesn't seem to be discussed. I've been helped by... Um, I made a couple of remarks on my Discord group. Link down below if you want to go on it. About this a uh, couple of weeks ago. And some people have very kindly already sent me some things. They've translated themselves. 
in one case, on ground on request that I do not admit that they've done it, uh, and do not say they've done it because they're not supposed to. So I went, thank you. Yes, I'll keep quiet on that one. Um, of other texts, but because there isn't much about them, and we need to. You cannot understand really your side of the of the operation or your side of a fleet action if you don't understand the other sides. You can't understand a battle if you only can think of it from your perspective. You can't learn the lessons of it if you only think of it from your perspective. So, thank you for watching. <laughs> you want a biscuit, Daniel? You are a stomach on legs, you realize.